All right, so um, hi everyone, welcome. We are gonna go ahead and get started with our Faithful Families Thriving Communities um, webinar on disaster recovery with Dr. Sarah Kirby. Um, and the way that the webinar is gonna work is I'm gonna introduce Dr. Kirby and then she's gonna give us a presentation. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to put those in the chat box um, or save them till the end and um, we'll have time for conversation and for questions with Dr. Kirby at the end. Um, so um, this webinar will also be recorded and it will be on the Faithful Families website along with any of the resources and materials that uh, Dr. Kirby shared. So let me go ahead and introduce her. Um, Dr. Sarah Kirby is a professor, Family Consumer Sciences Program Leader, Department Extension Leader, and Extension Specialist in the Department of Agricultural and, and uh, Human Sciences. She is the State Coordinator for the Healthy Homes Partnership, which focuses on improving the health and safety of children and their caregivers and homes by reducing housing hazards that cause injury and disease. Disease. Um, Dr. Kirby is also actively involved in educational programs related to preparation, response, and recovery after natural disasters. She's the program coordinator for MyPI North Carolina, a youth preparedness leadership and educational outreach program. And in addition to that, she teaches um, several courses in our Youth Family and Community Sciences graduate uh, program. She teaches professional ethics and family policy, environmental influences on the family, and she's also been very involved in the past in um, our supervised professional experience. And um, Dr. Kirby is also a mentor of mine, and so I'm really excited to have her with us um, today. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Annie. I would say that Annie's probably a mentor of mine as well. I don't think you have to be older to be the one mentoring. I think you can be mentored by all. And so Annie is one of, one of our faculty members and one of our specialists who is um, one of the most creative, um, most dedicated, and I um, always enjoy an opportunity to work with her. So I am going to go ahead and turn off my camera. You all can see that I am a live person um, and, um, you know, don't really need to be seen anymore. So I'll stop that and that way I can focus on not looking at myself while I'm talking. But um, I do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all a little bit today about disaster recovery and the role that faith communities can play um, in recovery. It is a really important topic and given the devastation that we've just had from Hurricane Florence and the fact that we still haven't really recovered from Hurricane Matthew, um, there's really no shortage of work that can be done um, by a variety of folks, including faith communities. So um, today I've got some objectives that I, I wanted to, to visit and, and hopefully this will all make sense when we, once we've sort of gone through them. But I wanted to talk to you first about what disasters are. Um, so we have the same definition when we talk about disaster. Um, we can talk, we'll talk a little bit about what disasters do um, in terms of how they affect families and some of the outcomes of um, stress and those sort of things that happen to families during time of disasters. We'll talk a little bit about who helps during disasters and then specifically the role that faith communities can play. We'll talk about some long-term um, ideas and some short-term ideas that faith communities may have a part of in terms of responding to disasters. And then well, what do we do when the next time comes? Because we know it will happen again because North Carolina has had a, a number of different kinds of disasters. This one just happened to be a hurricane. Um, when I talk today, I will be drawing upon um, the work of others. So you'll note that there are some citations in the slides. Um, if you want full references, I'm more than happy to provide those to you at, at some point. Some are done by scholars, some are from emergency management professionals or emergency related organizations. And then from time to time, I may even talk about some of my own experience in terms of um, disaster response and recovery because I've done it professionally. Um, through my job and extension and also as an individual uh, through my faith community to respond to disasters and to work with families. So um, hopefully that will be um, of use to you. I do want to start with uh, sort of a common definition about disaster. So, you know, most of us haven't lived through a disaster. 
hopefully some of you may have, but most of us have not. Um, disaster involves so uh, the destruction of property. It involves injury or the loss of life. So it's not just you know a, a small kitchen fire. It's 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 something major. It has an identifiable identifiable beginning and end. So we know when Hurricane Florence hit the coast. We know when she left. We know when the flooding began. We know when the flooding stopped. Sometimes it, it, it happens quickly. Sometimes it's a series of days or weeks or months that we experience a disaster. One thing about disaster though, it's not individual in that it affects a number of people, a large number of people, and that it's shared by more than one family member or by uh, you know, members of the public. What Florence did hit large communities. It wasn't just one small area. It was, it was a very large disaster that, that affected a number of people. It's outside of the realm of the ordinary. We don't do this every day. Um, and it's psychologically traumatic. And it's enough that it induces um, stress or distress in almost everyone, regardless of how we were before the disaster hit. So, you know, I may not have been affected by the disaster myself personally. My house is okay, my neighborhood's okay, but regardless of how I am now and how I was before, I was doing fine, no worries. After the disaster, I have greater concerns. It can be psychologically traumatic. Does that make sense to you all? And Sailor's the one that did this work in this area. So not only are people, are, are, um, now that we have a definition sort of, our, of disaster, we, we need to talk a little bit about what disaster does to communities. So when we, when we have a disaster, usually there's some sort of destruction of the infrastructure. So roads are, are washed out as we saw recently. Bridges may be down, um, power grids may be destroyed. Usually it's something that happens to the infrastructure of our communities or our states that, that, that is um, adverse, uh, that's negative. Um, there may be the absence of electricity. The, the power line, as I said, may be destroyed or down. There may not be clean drinking water. The sewage plants may be overrun. You know, there may be a whole host of issues that come along um, with your community. So, you know, when you don't have drinking water, that's an issue. When you can't flush toilets, that's an issue. When you don't have power, that is quite an issue. There's also destruction of physical contact. So you may not be able to reach people, um, those that you love. Um, people that are in your own community. I like to tell the story of um, my, my in-laws live in Moore, Oklahoma, and a number of years ago, a, a huge tornado went through Moore, and we could not access um, my in-laws. We couldn't call them by phone. People who lived in Oklahoma couldn't get to them. And so it, it's very difficult when you can't reach members of your community because, of, because a disaster has taken place. Um, and people are very vulnerable, and they're vulnerable to exploitation after disaster. So if you think about price gouging, you think about fraud, um, and there's even a, a, a studies or research that shows that human trafficking increases after a disaster, um, which is, is a, um, something that we're seeing more and more here in the state of North Carolina. Um, and then if you think about adding a disaster on top of that, that that's an extra concern. And then finally, this idea that it could happen again. Um, you know, some folks may have thought it would never happen to them. Some folks who went through Hurricane uh, Fran or Floyd or Matthew might have thought it's never gonna happen again. And yet it did. And so now that likelihood of it coming back is, is an issue, that's something that they're concerned about. Plus, if you watch during Hurricane Florence, you know, they weren't quite sure where she was gonna go and, and it looked like she might loop back around and hit us again. And so those are the kinds of things that, that um, happen in terms of communities, that, that things could happen again. And then how they affect families really depends on the type of disaster it was, uh, the intensity, how strong that disaster was, um, what kind of destruction there was, you know, if it, if, it, if it knocked down your fence, that's one thing. If it flooded your house, that's something totally different. How long that disaster last, lasted, and then the severity of the experience that, that the family has. Um, again, some of us have very small um, experience with disaster. It may be something minor, but those that experience um, major flooding or loss of house or loss of life, um, loss of a family member or friend, um, that certainly is significantly more um, impactful. 
And it can often, you know, find, uh, manifest itself with negative um, physical health or negative mental health. And so that's a, an important thing to, to remember. And then the other thing we have to think about is, is what happens to families after a disaster. So if you're trying to recover from a disaster, you may find that people, people don't act the way they used to. There, things happen. If, you, if, if, if your world has been turned upside down, it's very hard to function in the same way you, often, you always have. And so there are some things that can happen. For example, parents might uh, become more dysfunctional, maybe more disorganized, routines are off. Um, family members may have um, experienced more um, alcohol abuse or drug abuse um, because they're trying to cope as, as a coping mechanism. There may be more violence or conflict between family members or, um, and others because you're just not at your normal. Things are not normal and um, trying to figure out how to make things normal or how you're going to cope with um, the things that this disaster has brought upon you uh, can be very difficult and can cause conflict um, among people. And then there may be things like relocation, um, the idea of having to move from your community where you've always lived, um, losing a job, that certainly is stressful to a family. When you think about um, not only are people's homes flooded, but businesses are flooded, their livelihoods, think about some of the agricultural industries, their livelihoods have been destroyed. And so what do you do when you don't have money coming in? How do you feed your family? How do you pay your bills? How do you deal with all of those things that you used to before? Um, there may be um, a decrease in the availability of parents to their children. So they may not be physically available because they're cleaning up or they're trying to work or, or they just, they're just not present, or they may be emotionally unavailable because it's hard to it's hard to care for somebody else when you're trying to care for yourself when you're just sort of living you know day by day, moment by moment, and then children often get very um, affected because their social networks networks change. You know, they, their daycare may be closed, their preschool, their school, their friends may have had to move away because they too have had the same issues related to flooding and their normal routines and their activities are out of whack. And so that that really kind of puts families in this place where they, they have a more difficult time um, functioning after a disaster. And then the other thing, and because I'm a housing specialist, I, I like to talk about this is, um, you know, some disasters do result in the loss of home and, and the loss of possessions. And while many of us can say, oh, you know, it's just stuff, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, our stuff is, and our homes really contain sort of a lifetime of memories. Um, and when those things can be destroyed in, in a single event, it's really hard for us because we, we often look at, at our things, not just as possessions, but the feelings that are associated with those possessions. Um, there's a book called um, House as a Mirror that really talks about um, how people often feel this diminished sense of self and when possessions are destroyed um, because they are, they are such a part of our history and we assign meanings to those things. So for example, you know, the, the, the quilt your grandmother gave you um, right before she died may be destroyed in a flood and you might not be able to, to use it again. And it's not so much that it was a quilt, it's the fact that we have assigned meaning to that quilt, that it, it was a prized possession. My grandmother made it for me. I loved my grandmother and I want to keep a piece of her with me. So these are things that are, as, as you watch families, if you go through communities and you see all of their stuff out on the, the curb side, you have to think about how that affects a person to see your pictures, your, your, um, your textiles, your, you know, all of the things that you own out there and destroyed. So that's a, that's a big deal, I think. And then this other idea about connections to, to um, things that are an extension of yourself, your neighborhood, your street, familiar places. Um, the picture that you're looking at right now, um, the man on the right is somebody that we worked with when we went to go clean up some houses on a, on a trip in Mississippi. 
and he was so interesting. He was living in a community. He's leaving the community that he had lived with, lived in all his life. And he could tell you where the grocery store was that his grandfather ran and where his cousins lived. And, and if you think about the fact that he was leaving that community after 80 years of having lived there, that's, that's a loss. That's a huge loss. And there's some grief associated with that. So, um, you know, thinking about those things as you work with families or as faith-based faith -based communities start to look, work with families and understanding that those those things are all sort of tied up with what's going on with folks. And then there's this other thing, there's some compounded issues related to recovery um, because it really is influenced by many factors. Some people don't have the financial resources to recover. Um, or they may not have the right financial resources to recover. So, for example, you know, if you if you didn't have enough insurance, you may not be able to, to, to return your home back to the way it was. Or if you had insurance, but you didn't have flood insurance and your home flooded, then you were not eligible for the same kinds of things that you would be had you had flood insurance. So recovery is often difficult. And of course, limited resource individuals have an even greater time because they have um, are greater difficulty in recovering because they have fewer resources with which to tap into. They may not have had savings. They may not have had insurance. They may be renters. Um, and then also think about folks like older adults who um, are on a limited income, although I say all of us are really on a limited income. But they, they're, all of their wealth may be in their home. And so they really don't have anything else um, to help them overcome any sort of financial um, difficulties. One of the things that I think is really interesting is that we often talk about disasters being status levelers and in some ways I, I guess it is in that it really doesn't care if you're rich or poor. Um, if a disaster comes, a disaster comes. But the problem is that um, different economic levels cannot recover as easily. So the poor really suffer the greatest losses and have the most difficult time recovering um, from disaster. Uh, this picture that you see on your left um, was actually sent to me by a student today who um, lives in New Bern. And um, again, it just kind of shows the impact of what many of you probably have already seen or that we have seen on um, the news. So. So that's kind of uh, just sort of a background related to disasters and just remembering that, um, you know, for the most part, living through a disaster is new to most families. It's not something we do every day. Um, it's not something we want to do, certainly. Um, and, and people find themselves in positions that they never thought they'd be in. They're having to recover their house, having to recover from a traumatic event like being re uh, rescued um, from high waters or, um, you know, just the idea that, that my whole community has changed. And so I think it's important to keep those things in mind when we start thinking about what faith-based communities can do, what kinds of opportunities there are um, for communities to, to participate in, so. Sarah, this is Susan. Yes. You just showed that picture of Newburn. Yeah. My daughter teaches high school there. Oh, they really? Not, they have not gone back to work yet. It's unbelievable. And that, that says, yes. that kind yes, of... I'll let you know that. Yeah. The, and streets, that... the streets stink. I mean, it's pitiful. Absolutely okay. pitiful. And I think that speaks to the fact that communities are, are, are not back. You know, and here's the thing that, that, I, that I think about a lot. Um, when it comes to disaster, you know, as soon as, as soon as a disaster hits, everybody's ready to, to go help. What can I do to help? What can we do? What's, 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 what's needed? How can I, you know, give you food? How can I give you cleaning supplies? Can we come down and help? And, and North Carolina and the folks in North Carolina and outside this state and across this country are good at helping each other out. They're very good at helping each other out. But it's a lot like when somebody dies in your family, you know, everybody comes in for the funeral and they take good care of you during the funeral and then they leave and you're left with 
what's left. And, um, you know, people don't always stay long term. They, they go, they leave, they go about their lives. And, you know, here we are in Raleigh doing this and doing that, or we're, you know, out in the mountains doing our thing. But there are still people and there will be people for a long, long time recovering from this disaster, just like they're still recovering from Hurricane Matthew which was two years ago. So, and we've probably many of us that are not um, immediately affected have forgotten much of what happened during Hurricane Matthew. So, um, you know, there, there are things that are happening that we're just not aware of. So thanks for sharing that, Susan, I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that's important to know when it comes to disasters is, is who helps and when. So generally when a disaster hits, a community is responsible for um, responding to that disaster. So when you think about community, local government, private and volunteer agencies, and then what happens if it gets overwhelming, if the severity of the disaster is such that that community is overwhelmed and can no longer respond, then state resources kick in. And then when the state can no longer handle any more, when you need even greater response, that's when federal resources come in. So this disaster obviously was so severe and so great that it did require federal resources um, to help. Um, but that doesn't mean that the state and the community gets to say, oh, good, we have all the resources we need. FEMA's here to save the day. You know, here, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. That, that, that's not the case. All of these folks still need to be involved in disaster recovery. And a major part of that group um, really is in the community and in terms of private and volunteer agencies or private and volunteer organizations. And their role is kind of different. There are a lot of different roles they can play. And I think faith-based communities are considered part of this volunteer agency. Some of these agencies will travel, you know, from one community to another to assist victims, to assist in specific areas. So they may be sent, you know, like Red Cross will come, uh, Red Cross volunteers may come, or Baptist men may come. Um, Volunteer agencies also help with that critical stuff like food and shelter and clothing um, and re repairs and rebuilding after a disaster. Sometimes, too, they, um, I don't know why I put that one. Sometimes, too, though, they realize that they need more than just um, those traditional volunteer agencies. And we find that faith communities are playing an even larger role in um, responding to disasters than they ever have before. And these are just a few of the headlines that I pulled just recently related to um, Hurricane uh, Florence and also Hurricane Matthew about, you know, faith-based disaster relief teams. They were ready when the disaster hit. They um, actually provide more disaster recovery um, and coordinate with FEMA than other kinds of groups, and that they, they are ready to serve in so many different ways. Um, that we found that faith-based communities are an integral part of actually responding, uh, responding to and recovering from um, specific disasters. So what are those roles that faith communities can play? Um, so I, I thought this was kind of interesting, and we can talk about this. If you guys would like to talk to, I guess I should ask some questions. Um, you know, the, the National Disaster Interfaith Network says that there are really three good roles that communities play, and then we'll talk about some others as well. And the first is comfort and hope. The second is, is prayer and worship and, and various events. And the third is justice and healing. So I'll talk about these a little bit more in depthly. So when it comes to comfort and hope, really one of the things that faith-based communities can do better than, than almost anyone else is, is, is just sort of being a part of that community, providing hope and, and hospitality um, to, to the folks within a, a certain community. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to, um, to hear about somebody's pain or to see somebody's pain, to witness somebody's devastation. Um, but one of the things that faith communities are good at, really, are being empathetic and being supportive and being present and really just listening to folks. 
part of part of providing um, you know comfort is is allowing people to to tell their story, to and to tell it probably as as many times as it needs to be said. Um, and I think as a as a faith community, one of the things you can do is be patient and to um, to let people tell their story, being respectful of of their particular situation, of any cultural differences or awarenesses um, that you might need to be uh, sort of prepared for, um, but really, really just being there. Um, going back to my own experiences, I found that, that sometimes it's less about the work, even though there's always work that needs to, to be done, and more about allowing people to tell you what has happened to them, to help them process what has happened to them, and um, just take the time to, to be present with them. It's just, it's important not to, not to, you know, fix it or give advice necessarily, but, but just to, to be there with people as they, as they go through their issues. Um, you know, it takes time to adjust to loss. And um, it may be while, a while before their hope returns. One thing I do want to um, encourage you, though, um, as you work with communities, it's, it's often hard to know what to say. Um, and uh, the community emergency response team, uh, they do a thing on psychology of disaster. And this, these are the things they tell you not to say. They tell you, don't say, I understand because you probably don't, or even if you did, that, that in some way lessens an individual's experience. Um, because I can't understand everything that you're experiencing. I can't understand what somebody is going through. I can, I can be supportive, I can be present, but I can't understand it. Don't tell somebody not to feel bad. You know what? Let people validate somebody's feelings. If they wanna be mad, let them be mad. If they want to feel sad, let them feel sad. Um, that's part of processing grief, allowing people to, to own their own sort of emotions and, and, and let them work through them and just let them heal by sharing how they feel. And then this, this you're strong, you'll get through this. Well, what if you don't feel very strong? What if you don't? I'm not strong enough. I've heard people say I'm not strong enough. In which case you say, well, you know, just, just be there with them, saying it will take some time. It will take some time. Don't cry. Don't tell people not to cry. That's especially if you're uh, somebody's a crier. Let them cry. Let them work through all of that. And this one is really hard, especially for, for people of faith, but to say it's God's will. Um, and especially if you're talking to people um, when you don't know what their faith is, um, do not do not share it's God's will um, as, a, as just sort of a throwaway statement because it, it can go negatively on you. And besides, then, then you say, why, why me and not you kind of thing. So, um, and then don't say it could be worse. At least you still have, you know, your health or your house or the other, you know, your family, because it, it, that negates, again, that, that sort of negates everything that they have lost that is important to them. And everything is going to be okay. You don't know if it's going to be okay. You hope it's going to be okay. But all you can do, really, is to support them as they work through this issue. Does any of that make sense to you? Any comments on that? Have you ever found yourself at a loss for what to say? Silence. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it is hard. It's very hard. And 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 it, it, it is it's just one of those things that you know sometimes if you don't know what to say, don't say anything or say, well, I'm here to help in any way I can. That's what you can say. You know, I'm here to support you. Um, not to fix it, not to give advice. But to be here and walk with you through, through your, your situation at the time. So yeah, it can it can be very hard. Um, the other thing that um, faith communities are obviously good at is um, prayer, um, whatever kind of prayer it may be, whatever kind of faith it may be, um, worship, and and having events for folks. 
um, whether it be a memorial service, a commemoration service, a, um, an event to just bring communities together to talk about loss, um, whatever it may be, there are opportunities for faith communities to do that. And it really kind of helps people find some meaning in the middle of a crisis. Um, and by meaning, I don't mean like, oh, it's a sign, this is what it means. It's more about finding meaning by connecting with each other in communities and, and you know, um, developing relationships and finding meaning through helping each other through different kinds of difficulties and coming together as a community. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to find meaning in crisis, but it does sort of show us sort of our human um, side and how people take care of each other during times of needs. Um, it's a, one of those things that, that we can do to help people kind of solve their immediate crisis and, and to work their way through recovery. And then finally, um, according to the National Disaster Interface Network, the, the idea of justice, bringing justice and healing um, as a part of a faith community. So sort of being a non-anxious presence. Um, you know, when everything else is uncer uncertain, um, commu faith communities can sort of be the, the constant or the calm. So a place to go to when, when people need respite, a place to go to when, when, when people need to feel a sense of spirituality or calmness or, or whatever it may be to get away from the chaos and the, um, the, the disarray of what's going on around them. Um, the other thing that faith communities can do is um, provide expertise on the needs of the population. So as people come in to work in a community, they can say, you know, we have, we have these kinds of folks in our community. We may have a Hispanic population that has specific needs. We may have a low-income population that has specific needs. We may have a population that, um, that uh, non-English speaking audience that, that has some particular needs. So being able to help provide expertise about the needs of the community um, and, and, and who is the community. The other thing they can provide religious and cultural guidance. So, um, you know, if, if there are funerals that have to be had, they can provide religious um, offerings there. If there's if there's different kinds of cultures and that need to be approached in different ways, they can they can provide that as well. Um, but you know, faith based communities tend to know the beliefs and the cultures of an of a community, whether or not it's it's that community or that faith community's um, uh, religion or um, you know way of practice, it doesn't matter that they are aware that, that those are there and they can help direct people in terms of that. And then also this, this idea to promote efforts um, to actually, it shouldn't be promote efforts to crime, but to, to promote efforts to stop potential crime. So fraud, um, domestic violence, um, and again, those vulnerable people such as human trafficking, the idea that you can share information about, about um, what's going on in a community and help protect folks from um, potential, in potential victims of crime. So the other thing that I think is important that faith communities have an opportunity to do is to share accurate knowledge. Um, and sometimes it's hard to know where you can get accurate knowledge. Um, this actually is the FEMA page that is the North Carolina Hurricane uh, Florence disaster page. Um, that you can go to at any time and it talks about the different sorts of resources and information that um, are being responded to on the federal level related to Hurricane Florence. So, and then it also has information about um, North Carolina Department of Transportation and emergency management. So that's sort of a go-to place um, to find information. But even more, inf uh, more important, I think, is the other link that is on that page, which is about Hurricane Florence rumor control. So one of the things that we do know is that during a hurricane, or during a disaster, there are all kinds of rumors going along around. And um, getting back to that idea of how helping to prevent fraud and helping to prevent um, vulnerability, um, it's important to know what kind of rumors are going around. So, so there are always some 
But this is the list that I pulled off today of just a few of the ones that are going on. So for example, renters can't apply for FEMA assistance. Faith-based communities can help provide information that indeed renters can apply for FEMA assistance. About, um, you know, home inspecting, uh, home inspectors asking applica applicants for registration numbers. And um, the idea about um, flood insurance policy, and that you can go back and buy a, a flood insurance policy after the fact and it'll be retroactive to what was already happening. That doesn't, that doesn't occur. So there's always somebody who's looking to take advantage of, of people who at their most vulnerable. And so the ability of the, the faith community to, to help share information through their networks in their own congregation or outside their, their, um, their uh, members is a, is a really great role that faith-based communities can play. Currently, there are 28 different counties already under disaster declarations, um, and they have both short-term and long-term needs. There may be other counties that were actually affected, but these are the ones that are, are currently um, recognized as having needs. And so in terms of thinking about long or short-term or immediate needs, what can faith-based communities do? Well, first, you know, Everybody says to donate cash. That's always a, a, a great thing to do, um, especially after, uh, immediately after a disaster because we don't really know what's needed. And so being able to donate cash or, or put some of your resources toward um, disaster relief organizations, those that are recognized um, can be an important thing. You can volunteer with recognized organizations and then you can donate goods, those specific goods that have been identified by organizations as being needed. Um, you know, don't, don't gather up all your old clothes and take them to the, um, to the Salvation Army if that's not what they need or to Goodwill, if that, or not Goodwill, or Red Cross if that's not what they need. They may be in need of more, um, more um, hands-on kinds of things like um, bleach and buckets and, and brushes. So know, know what to donate and know what kind of volunteers they need. Um, and some of the recognized groups will be, you know, Red Cross, FEMA, Salvation Army, all of those kinds of things. But there are many, many, many others that may be in your community. Um, the Voluntary Organizations Active in Disasters are, are, is a group of um, member organizations that really um, work to provide um, cooperation, communication, coordination, and collaboration after a disaster. And this includes theme, uh, this includes the Red Cross, it includes the Salvation Army, includes all of those groups that you typically see after a disaster. So there's no shortage of availability um, to have volunteers. And in North Carolina, we also, also have our own um, statewide VOAD, um, and if you were to go on their site today, which you can see listed right there, you can look at the various opportunities um, for volunteers um, to help with Hurricane um, Florence. Right now, typically it, it tends to be um, clean up kinds of stuff, tearing out kinds of things. Um, but it's interesting, if you go on that same site, you'll note that they're still needing volunteers for Hurricane Matthew, and those are more rebuilding opportunities. But if you're looking for a place where you might be able to volunteer today, if you wanted to do a short-term episodic kind of volunteer experience, this may be a great place for you to go or for a faith community to go to see where they might be able to plug in. Um, but thinking longer term, again, like, like uh, a death in the family, when everybody leaves is sometimes when you need the most help. So if you can think longer term as a faith-based community, think about what kinds of activities you're currently doing and try to align those activities with what you might do to help respond to a disaster. So for example, look at, look at what you're doing. Do you have a childcare ministry? Do you have food ministries or youth programs or social justice programs or health ministries? And think about them like this, in this way. If you have a childcare ministry or if you have a preschool ministry, can you offer scholarships to those who may have lost their childcare facility? Um, or, you know, wherever they take their child on a regular basis. Can you offer um, scholarships to, to parents who may have lost their jobs because of um, 
you know, their, their place of business or their, their, where they're employed has been destroyed. If you have a food ministry, things like uh, backpack buddies, can you take on some additional children who may have been affected, who may have had plenty of food to begin with, or may have been close to um, being at food scarcity, but, but now find themselves at a place where they must have food. Or if you have a regular um, nonprofit or food bank that you typically um, um, work with or collaborate with, can, can you work with the members of your community to, um, to increase what you offer to those groups? And because if that's what you're doing anyway, it's more likely that it will continue. You just might have to do it at a bigger level. In terms of family supports, you know, um, what can you offer families? So the support groups like grief share, divorce share or or uh, Friday night off where where um, you bring in families that have been affected by a, a community show them a movie let them have uh, some sort of time off from the disaster that they just experienced in terms of health you know do you have do you have blood pressure checks do you check on older adults um, my community has a blood drive a couple of times a year and we could do another blood drive on the fly if, if necessary, if, if blood's needed. So think about those things that you're already doing. Um, and a homeless ministry might be something that maybe you've done before. We, we host um, homeless families, I think three times a year uh, for a week in our community. Maybe you can do that more often because the need may be greater. So think about these kinds of things and, and, and figure out what you're good at, what your community is good at and how you might be able to to leverage what you're doing with what can be done to help um, those that have been affected by disaster. Can you guys think of any others um, that might be useful in terms of what communities might already be doing um, that, that could be enhanced or continue to help disaster victims? Okay, you can type it in the chat box if you want. Um, and then also long term, think about uh, an even greater commitment, perhaps thinking about connecting the activities and uh, that you might want to do with the skills and, and licenses that are present with members in your organization. So if you have a, a contractor who has a license or whether it be a, you know, a building contractor or an HVAC contractor or a plumber, you know, are there ways we can connect those skills and licenses with people that need those? Um, healthcare professionals um, can be particularly helpful. And you, you have animal care, food preparation skills, um, a commercial driver's license, uh, somebody who might have training in uh, community or emergency response um, teams. Um, do you have people who are bilingual who can speak the language of, of folks in the community to help facilitate um, recovery? So, you know, trying to sort of get a, um, a database of, of what people do in your communities and how they might be able to help in different ways is important because faith communities can often be the ones that, that make this happen when other kinds of professionals or other kinds of groups have, have, have gone. Um, and then another thing I would say is, does your faith community have a national or an international disaster relief effort? And if they do, think about sending a team to help respond to the disaster. Or another, another thing that's often helpful is if you host a team. So there may be teams that come in from all over the country or maybe even the world that want to help respond to Hurricane Florence. They will need a place to stay. So do you have um, a uh, you know, a, a congregational area where, where people can spend the night and stay for a week? Do you have facilities for taking showers or cooking meals or those sorts of things? Um, because sometimes hosting a team is, is, is essential because people get worn out in communities and, and getting fresh legs and fresh eyes and fresh enthusiasm to help respond to a disaster um, is important. And we will be responding to this for, for many years to come. And then finally, think about providing needed team, needed tools that um, teams may need. So, you know, they may need they may need drills and hammers and and um, saws and different kinds of supplies um, to help 
recover. So eventually they'll need drywall and, and screws and, and all of those kinds of things that, that are needed to help rebuild. And they also, of course, need to be fed. So think about how your community, how a faith community might be able to host someone else who uh, is coming into the community. And then thinking even longer term, think about preparing your, your faith community as well as the entire community for disasters that will happen at some point, we don't know when, in the future. And so um, there are a variety of ways you can do that. One is to, um, one resource that I've used in preparing this is this engaging faith-based and community organizations um, planning considerations guide. And it's, it's really a, a great guide to talk about how you can prepare a faith-based organization to deal with disasters. And really it talks about seven different steps and, you know, including um, engagement, which is, which is really just sort of figuring out who's in the community, understanding the very characteristics of your community and the populations and the cultures and starting having conversations with each other and building relationships well before a disaster ever occurs. So that when one does occur, you all know each other. Um, and then the second thing is assessing the, the, um, the skills and capabilities and the interests of members of your um, organization. Um, so what, what kinds of skills or what kinds of um, skills and interests does, does the, the community have as a whole and then individually? So there are things that you can respond, respond to sort of corporately and then there are things that you can respond to um, through individual members of your community. And think about having some training. Um, work with the Red Cross or FEMA or other volunteer agencies to figure out how you can learn more about emergency response training um, and how you can um, sponsor training perhaps for members of your community. And providing any technical assistance, um, any skills or assistance you'd like to develop. Some, some churches actually serve, or not just churches, but other, other kinds of um, locations serve as um, a mass care or a shelter for members of their communities. Um, and then participate in disaster emergency exercises in the communities as, as they will happen in the future. Affiliate with other recognized organizations and then really integrate this idea of preparing for disasters as part of your faith culture. So, you know, how we take care of our members is, is by preparing, helping people prepare for disaster. And, and not just when a hurricane's coming, but perhaps yearly, maybe before it, we have an ice storm, uh, uh, every year before an ice storm or every year before hurricane season starts. Those are the times that, that we can remind members of, of your organization that um, disaster preparedness is, is essential. Um, and then again, the National Disaster Interface Network has a bunch, a bunch, 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 bunch of fact sheets that are really helpful um, for um, faith-based communities to talk about being ready for disasters. They have information on um, what, what kinds of roles that faith-based communities play. They have um, fact sheets on spiritual care, they have fact sheets on mental health, um, just a whole variety of things that, that um, folks may want to be aware of. And the fact that it's an interfaith network I think is important because um, we do know that, that there are a number of different faiths across North Carolina and they often work together um, as part of the larger community when, when disasters happen. So. So I kind of talked about the things of, uh, you know, what is a disaster, how they affect families, who helps, some of the roles we can play long-term long and short-term, and how to prepare for next time. So now I guess it's, it's time to ask you all questions. Do you have any questions for me, or do you have anything else you would have rather seen um, than this, than this um, focus in this webinar? Well, I just wanted to uh, kind of recap some of the comments that were happening while you were. Um, I can see any of them. Yeah, while you were talking. So, um, oh, okay. So, some things that were said in terms of like how faith communities can support recovery, um, they can start working with other faith communities they don't often partnership.
together, which could lead to a longer term collaboration instead of working in silos. Absolutely. Um, That's huge because it, it, it's, there's too much for any one organization to take care of, any one community to take care of. And working together really, it's, I think it's more rewarding and provides meaning, I think, to what's, what's um, happening in the community. So. And Ellen and Josie had some really good ideas about just like what you were saying, Sarah, that what people need sometimes is someone to listen and, um, and not having, you know, not responding, but um, just Josie was saying offering space where people can just be together and um, even have fellowship. And, and, um, and Ellen, similar to that, was saying that faith communities can host like listening sessions, surveys, long, longer term after a storm, like six months out. And later to see how people were recovering and then followed up to say that um, a United Methodist Church in Faison did an outdoor movie and popcorn night just as like a stress reliever. Absolutely. <clears throat> I think I think all of those are wonderful ideas. The idea that you can be a you can be a facilitator of discussion. So you can bring in all kinds of folks. You can bring in, you know, the decision makers of the community, you can bring in the members of normal lay public members of the community to have discussions. You can be just a safe place where people can go and, and, and get away from their issues. And that idea of popcorn in a movie is fantastic because, you know, cleanup is so overwhelming. And even if you're not one who's in the middle of it, driving by it on a daily basis, experiencing it through your friends, through your neighbors, um, by watching television, it, it can be overwhelming. And so giving people a safe place to sort of get away from it all and think about something different, even if it's just for a little bit of time, um, is important. Because um, you have to take care of yourself when you're going through this sort of thing. And I would say too, for, the, for faith communities, as they start to work with folks and listen to the stories, um, it's important for them to take care of themselves as well, because you, you do experience somebody's pain and it's, it's hard to bear somebody else's burden sometimes. And so having an opportunity to be able to talk through that with other folks is, is important as well. Other thoughts? So Peggy just shared an idea that is going through cooperative extension, but could also be another way that faith communities can support people who are um, displaced due to um, disaster. So she's talking about how the Onslow County schools are still not open and will not open any earlier than October 15th. So they're trying to get 4-H and do activities in the shelters to work with kids who are displaced so that they, like you were saying, Sarah, with like their sense of normalcy being so off, if there are ways to support children and get them you know, playing and doing things that children need to be doing, um, even in these situations that are really, really hard and, and traumatic. <clears throat> that's a great idea. I think that's wonderful because you, and children can't understand. Um, they know that something's different. They know they can't go home. They know mom and dad are stressed or grandma's stressed or whoever's stressed. And um, they, they long, you know, we, we all long for normalcy. And so, um, allowing them something different and, and to play and laugh and um, get rid of some probably pent up energy would be good for them and probably good for those that are caring for them as well. So um, it's hard for kids. Kids, kids, kids will follow, um, follow the leads of the adults around them. So that's a, that's a good thing. Great suggestion. Does anyone have any questions for Sarah? <clears throat> Will the slides be available? Can we get, can we post your slides on the website? I don't think that I asked you that, Sarah. Um, I think you can. I There are a couple that are, um, that I've listed uh, <laughs> something on that that was um, um, the source of it. So I, I may go through and make sure that none of them are um, propri proprietary and uh, make sure that, that that's acceptable. But yes, I'd be happy to share. That would be great. And that's um, a good follow up. We This is recorded. And so we'll be putting this on the Faithful Families website as well as our um, um, 
YouTube channel, and we'll also be sharing some of the resources that Dr. Kirby has shared with us, so some of these links. And then also, um, as I mentioned in the chat box, like following up with some of you um, about these suggestions that you all had and in the coming weeks telling some of these, um, so these ways that faith communities are supporting recovery efforts um, and sharing those through our Faithful Families blog. Um, so we would love to hear about kind of what your, what your communities are doing as an example for things that other communities ha can do, because I think we've already seen some conversation here about, oh, I hadn't thought about that, and that's a, that's a good idea. So we, we want to do more sharing like that in the coming weeks. So. If we don't have any more questions, I'm going to thank Dr. Kirby for her time and for sharing with us. Um, this has been really, really helpful and um, a lot of great information shared and things that will be um, helpful, not only like you said in this kind of long-term recovery effort, but also helping us think about preparation um, in the future and the ways that we can support communities, the ways that faith communities can support communities as they address um, these long-term traumas and impacts from disasters. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Sarah. This thank great. you. And thank you all for coming. Um, we will, like I said, be posting all this on the Faithful Families um, website. And if you haven't already, check out our new website. It's just faithfulfamilies.com. Um, and I'll put that in the, in the chat box. But we have, um, we already have a blog post. Um, we already have a blog post with some disaster resources, including links to the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina and their, some of their um, food assistance resources. Um, but we'd love to share more and have continued dialogue with you all. Um, so thanks for being here and thanks for sharing. All right, you all have a, a good Thursday afternoon. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Annie. Bye. Bye.